This is a recording of themes from the Philokalia. Number one, <clears throat> Watchfulness and Prayer by Archimandrite I on Nikios, translated from the Greek by Jenny E. Gentites and Archimandrite Ignatius Apostolopoulos, with an introduction by Father John Chak Chakos. Preface The study of divine principles teaches knowledge of God to the person who lives in truth, longing and reverence. The pious study of the sacred scripture leads to opening of the door of divine knowledge, to revelation of ineffable mysteries, to a purified heart burning with heavenly longing and divine eros for the kingdom of God and eternal life. This is eternal life, that they know thee the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. In the contemporary rabble of human opinions and false knowledge, in the flood of human words and philosophies, Blessed is the man who, on the law of the Lord, meditates day and night. And these are all quotes. The, in, uh, the Philokalia is a true neptic encyclopedia, i.e., an encyclopedia of watchfulness, study, and commentary of Holy Scripture, and of the mystical Orthodox tradition. It is a philosophy of action in Christ, the God-man. It is the road leading man to his divine destiny, to deification by grace, and to contemplation through asceticism. It is a collection of powerful texts, the fruit of orthodox spirituality. They are offered here in fragments from the classic work, the Philokalia. Our orthodox church is the church of the fathers, of watchfulness, of asceticism, of the Philokalia. The Niptic hue of the Philokalia permeates the church in all of its expressions and arts. An effort is made here to recover this purely orthodox color like the marvelous Byzantine fresco which has been painted over and covered by fleshly rationalistic European painting of Western origin. The themes from the Philokalia must uncover it within Holy Scripture, the lives of our saints, the apothegmata of the ascetics, the texts of the fathers, our hymnology, our liturgy, our contemporary ascetic scene. Besides, the depth of the Orthodox life according to the fathers of the Philokalia is not new, it is the very essence of the everlasting, inviolate, and unchanging tradition of our church. Themes from the Philokalia are intended mainly for the average layman. They seek to contribute to knowledge of the mystical life of our church to the general public. Especially in our times, the thirst for such a pure fountain becomes stronger in fellow Orthodox as well as the heterodox and followers of of Eastern religions drowning in the sea of an egocentric or demonic mysticism. Only Orthodox mysticism is life, grace, joy, light, and truth. Themes from the Philokalia will comprise a series of separate volumes readily accessible and easy to comprehend. We present here the first volume in the series titled Watchfulness and Prayer. It is our hope that spiritual progress and watchfulness coupled with frequent sacramental and Eucharistic life, will help essentially our shepherds and their flock with their spiritual renewal in Christ during these difficult, arid, and unproductive years. Whatever these themes have to say is not the property of the poor needy author. Their consent content is but a loan from the inexhaustible spiritual treasury of the Holy Fathers and from the inheritance they left to us, their modern, unwise children. An inheritance which up to now has remained untouched on the dusty shelves of our libraries. They have only this to say, only this message to send. It is full time now for you to wake from sleep. It is time for repentance and joyful mourning. It is time for watchfulness and prayer. Introduction Journey to the Kingdom Within a man saw his friend searching for something on the ground. What have you lost, my brother? he asked. My key, said the man. So his friend went down on his knees too, and they both looked for it. After a time, the other man asked, Where exactly did you drop it? In my own house. Then why are you looking here? There is more light here than inside my own house. This little story is a parable of modern life. 
We look for insight and understanding into the nature of things. We search for meaning and direction to life. We desire communion with God, but we go on searching in the wrong places. The light in our parable corresponds to the intellectual approach to life. The darkness has to do more with the heart, the spirit, the inner life of a person. As people who are strongly influenced by a culture that places a premium on rational thought, we are faced with a dilemma when it comes to God. In order to find Him, we have to let go of intellect, of reason, of the ego, and enter the darkness of the, our innermost self. St. Isaac the Syrian, the, that great mystic of our church, puts it this way, Make peace with yourself, and heaven and earth will make peace with you. Take pains to enter into your own innermost chamber, and you will see the chamber of heaven. For they are one and the same, and entering one you behold them both. Then, This then is the task of every Orthodox Christian. We are to enter the innermost chamber of the self, sometimes called the heart. And there we are to look for the deposit of grace. The buried talent given to us in baptism, the gift has not been destroyed, but only buried as a treasure in the ground of our hearts. If we truly desire to find what the Lord has given to us in baptism, then we must diligently search to unearth this treasure of the heart and bring it to light. This can be done in two ways. In the words of St. Gregory of Sinai, the gift of baptism is revealed, first of all, by a painstaking fulfillment of the commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The more we carry these out, the more clearly the gift shines upon us in its brilliance. Secondly, it comes to light and is revealed through the continual remembrance of God in prayer. We will refer to the first method as the outer journey, and in, in itself it is very powerful. But the second method is more so, giving strength to our fidelity to the commandments. For this reason, we should hasten to make our inner journey to God's kingdom. Let us focus our attention on this inner journey to the kingdom within, why we must make it, how it is made, and what treasure it produces. Why must we make the inner journey? The essence of Christian life has more to do with the inner life of the soul than with external conduct. Unless we plunge into the depths of our being through the doorway of repentance, fidelity to the commandments by itself cannot save us. St. Theophan the Recluse in the anthology The Art of Prayer teaches that people concern themselves with Christian upbringing but leave it incomplete. They neglect the most essential and most difficult side of Christian life and dwell on what is easiest, the visible and external. We have to be wary of observing with the utmost correctness all the formal and outward rules for devout conduct while neglecting the inner life of the soul. We all know what it means to be Pharisaic, in the practice of our faith. Theophan reminds us that this approach to the spiritual life results in a lack of inner peace. In essence, what Theophan is saying is that we must address ourselves to the needs of the whole person and not just a single part. Theophan goes on to say that without inner spiritual prayer, there is no prayer at all, for this alone is real prayer, pleasing to God. At times we are all guilty of being parrots when we pray. We glibly mouth the words, but our hearts and minds are a thousand miles away. When inner prayer is absent, the words have not only the appearance, have only the appearance and not the reality of prayer. Are there not certain prayers that all of us have come to say in an automatic way? We go through all the motions of prayer, but our hearts and minds are not in it. The Lord's Prayer, for example, is one that we most commonly abuse in this way. We can actually recite the words and be thinking of something completely unrelated. This double-minded approach to prayer must be avoided at all costs. The essence of prayer has been properly described by Theophan as the spiritual lifting of the heart towards God. Surely, one of the most profound statements ever made about inner prayer was given to us by Isaac the Syrian. Enter eagerly into the treasure house that lies within you, and so you will see the treasure house of heaven. For the two are the same. There is but one single entry to them both. The ladder that leads to the kingdom is hidden within you, and is found in your soul. Dive into yourself and in your soul, and you will discover the rungs by which to ascend. End quote. What a profound mystery this prayer journey into the inner space becomes. As we descend into the depths of our being, we ascend to the heights of heaven. Have we not all at one time or another ascended the ladder to heaven during some privileged moment of deep inner prayer or worship? The Divine Liturgy calls us to many such moments. Let us lift up our hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. 
Theophan describes this ascent to inner spiritual prayer as evolving in three phases. The first degree is bodily prayer, which consists for the most part of reading, standing, and making prostrations. With this form of prayer, the heart initially feels nothing and has no desire to pray. On Mount Athos, the young monks are instructed to begin reciting the Jesus prayer out loud, even while engaging in other activities. After a while, the bodily prayer in this case moves from the lips into the mind, thus becoming mental prayer, or as Theophan calls it, prayer with attention. At this stage of prayer, we begin focusing the mind on the words of prayer, making the words our own. Of course, as we attempt to pray in this way, many distracting thoughts will disturb our focus. The phenomenon of instant replay will bring, bring to mind a host of troubling emotions, conflicts, fears, and anxieties. The muddied water of an active life rise up to quench our prayer of attention, but we must discipline ourselves to remain silent. The third degree of, that Theophan speaks of is the feeling of prayer, the prayer of feeling. When the heart itself is warmed by a feeling that results in continuous contrition, what before was a pious thought now becomes a feeling. A contrite phase becomes contrition itself. In a sense, we are taken over by the prayer. We no longer recite prayer, we are prayer. When this sense of being taken over by prayer occurs, real prayer may be said to begin. The spiritual realm opens up to us when we are granted the vision of another world, <clears throat> to use the words of Theophan. God taps us on the shoulder with his call of deeper prayer. Now we must respond to it. God has done his part, and now we must give him resounding our yes. From this point on, we must work to keep ourselves in this state of grace. Many good beginnings in prayer have come to naught for lack of commitment to this deeper way of life. Many of us stop here. We are afraid to make the inner journey to this kingdom. But for those who wish to continue the next journey, the question that arises is, how do we make the inner journey? Regarding the inner journey, Theophan prefaces his teaching with a paradoxical statement. He tells us that we will achieve nothing by our own efforts. Yet God will not give us anything unless we work with all of our strength. Remember the pilgrim in the way of the pilgrim? He was told to give the quantity and God would provide the quality. It's like trying to start fire by rubbing two pieces of wood together. If we don't rub, the fire won't start. Yet at precisely what moment the fire comes, we can't say... We can't say. Think of the dancer who tries to master a certain routine. She rehearses it over and over again until one day it comes effortlessly. The dance and the dancer become one. Listen to this testimony cited by Theophan about a man from Kiev who said, I did not use any methods at all. I did not know the Jesus prayer. Yet by God's mercy I walk always in his presence. But how this has come to pass I myself do not know. God gave. Real prayer, we must realize, is always God-given. Otherwise, we may confuse the gift of grace with some achievement of our own. About the methodology of prayer, Theophan teaches that God is pleased by two forms of prayer, that written by others in our own prayers. <clears throat> Only prayer said in a perfunctory manner is displeasing to God. With any prayer that is read, however, we must make it our own. Also, it is not enough just to wait for the desire to pray. To achieve spontaneous prayer, we must force ourselves to pray, even when we don't feel like it. Every Orthodox Christian should have his or her own prayer rule. That is a set time for prayer. This discipline should be adhered to faithfully. To assist us in our spiritual journey, we must all enlist the services of a spiritual guide, one who is experienced in a spiritual life and faithfully follows his or her counsel to follow his or her counsel to us. As the Father so often remind us, we can do nothing by ourselves. The pitfalls are many for those who would make the inward journey. Spiritual pride is particularly dangerous. For this reason, the desert Christians teach, If you see a young monk climbing up to heaven by his own will, grab him by the feet and throw him down, for this is to his profit. St. Anthony confirms the wisdom of this saying with these words, So far as possible for every step that is a monk takes, for every drop of water that he drinks in his cell, he should entrust the decision to the old men to avoid making some mistake in what he does. In quote, we must never doubt that at the very moment we begin praying, our adversary the devil will seek every possible avenue to open, open to him to bring us down. 
Our spiritual guide must be there to help us over the high and low points of the journey. Self-stripping through obedience to another is the orthodox way. As the length of prayer, as to the length of prayer, Saint Dmitri Rostov teaches that prayer should be short but oft repeated. In this way, the mind will not be distracted in the search for words, as Saint John of the Letter instructs us. The shorter prayers allow the mind to focus itself. The faithful repetition of the Jesus prayer allows us to concentrate on the deeper reality that it conveys. After all, the purpose of all prayer is to take place is to place us in the presence of God. We must go beyond the words to the reality. Simple prayer like the Jesus prayer facilitates this process. It takes us a step beyond reason. We can let go. It makes it easier for us to contain the wandering of the mind. On Mount Athos, for example, the Jesus prayer is reduced to five words in Greek. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. <clears throat> Besides short prayers, Theophan teaches that psalms, hymns, and church songs can help in achieving the state of inner prayer. He writes, The Spirit of God filled his elect, and they expressed the plenitude of their feelings in songs. He who sings them as they should be sung enters again into the feelings which the author experienced when he originally wrote them. Let's take the liturgy as an example of what Theophan is talking about. In the beginning we feel a dryness. The service is not alive to us. As we focus on the prayers, hymns, and petitions, however, we have a change of heart. What before seemed dry and boring comes alive. The spark of baptismal grace that is hidden within us burns brighter and with greater warmth. In the words of Theophan, psalms, hymns, and spiritual odes fan the spark and transform it into flame. He likens this action to the wind igniting a spark hidden in firewood. Theophan speaks again about this spark of grace in connection with the Jesus prayer. He teaches that when God's spark falls into the heart, the Jesus prayer fans it into flame. He is quick to point out that the prayer itself does not produce the spark, but only prepares the way for it. When the fire of grace appears in the heart, then it is possible for self-acting or infused prayer to begin. The attitude that we must that we have when praying is also a precondition for its ultimate success. Theophan instructs us to stand before God in reverence and fear with the mind and the heart. He goes on to say that feelings of fear and sorrow in the sight of God, the broken and contrite heart, are the principal features of true inner prayer. At this point, we must issue a warning when these feelings are absent. Spiritual pride and delusion are real dangers of the spiritual life. Many have fallen thinking that they are spiritually advanced. When in doubt as to the disposition of our prayer life, we must consult with our spiritual guide. One last thing with regard to the methodology of prayer that must be emphasized. No progress can be made without suffering. To pray in this deeper way is a struggle. A struggle against distraction, against temptation, against our tendency to be lax regarding spiritual endeavor. In the words of Theophan, He who proceeds without suffering will bear no fruit. Those who are condemned for spiritual fruitlessness will hear the words, Take the talent from him. We are reminded in scripture that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. The violent take it by force. Via via is an often repeated phrase on Mount Athos. That is, be forceful with yourself. In America, don't we say, no pain, no gain? What are the treasures that we can unearth through this type of inner prayer? A woman who began in earnest to use the Jesus prayer expected more from it than she appeared to receive. She went to her spiritual father and inquired of him, Why do I feel nothing when I pray? In her mind, the fruits of prayer should be joy, ecstasy, and beatitude. Instead of these exalted states, she was only feeling remorse over her sinfulness. St. Theophan's answer is very illuminating for all of us. The, quote, the principal fruit of prayer is not warmth and sweetness, but fear of God and contrition. End quote. In our spiritual infancy, we look for Taborian experiences when we pray. We become easily disappointed when nothing seems to happen. We question the efficacy of our prayer. But Theophan reminds us that we, what we seek in prayer is to establish in our hearts a quiet but warm and constant feeling towards God. He is quick to add, though, that when God does, not, does give us a mountaintop experience in prayer, we must be grateful for it and not imagine that it is due to ourselves. Nor are we to be dismayed when the ecstasy leaves us. 
to help us put things in a little better perspective when it comes to aesthetic states, the following anecdote may be helpful. A certain pious woman described the method she used to get her dog into the basement. She would take a piece of meat, lead him to the tops of the steps, then throw it down the basement for him to retrieve. Ecstatic states of prayer, when they do come, often are preparation for some new challenge to our lives. Strengthened by the moment on the mountain, we have to descend into the valley of life's problems. It might be that a cross is waiting for us. Theophan enjoins us to practice the prayer in simplicity, with our attention in the heart, always holding on to the remembrance of God. This concentration results in the centering of the mind, devoutness and fear of God, recollection of death, and stillness of thought, and a certain warmth of heart. Theophan calls these natural fruits of prayer in the heart, and not the fruit of grace. He tells us that lest we become boastful about what is happening, often only when grace comes, Theophan teaches, can prayer be said to begin. When the, the coming of grace, he adds, is the sign that God has looked on us in mercy. One thing that Theophan will not do, however, is to describe what happens when grace does come. Like most of the fathers and mothers of the church, Theophan maintains a pious silence on this point. Their only answer seems to be, when grace comes, you will know it. In baptism and chrismation, chrismation, then we all receive the gift of grace. According to this, we should therefore burn in our spirit, which is animated by the Holy Spirit. Why is it then that we are not alive with baptismal fervor? We have buried the deposit of grace, preoccupied with worldly affairs. Preoccupation with worldly affairs can overwhelm a fledgling inner life. Fledgling inner life. In order to unearth the death's treasure and fan the spark of grace into flame, we must reorder our priorities, orienting our lives towards the contemplation of what is divine, holy, heavenly, and eternal. We must first begin by obeying all the commandments of God. Then, with the name of Jesus on our lips and in our minds, we must plunge into the depths of our being, seeking to be the buried talent. When we have applied ourselves to this work with patience and humility, God in His mercy will envelop us with lo His love. He will also discover a new spiritual world of unsurpassed beauty and calm, a world where Jesus Christ reigns in our hearts forever. That was by Father John Chakos. <clears throat> and um, the prologue will begin shortly.